This is Don Cusick with the Music Biz, and today I have with me Buddy Killen, who is the head president, chief executive officer, chief cook and bottle washer at uh, Tree International Publishers, one of the biggest publishers in the world. Buddy, how did you get started in the music industry? Well, I, uh, I was a musician down in Florence, Alabama. I grew up uh, learning to play music, put, put little bands together. Uh, throughout high school, mm -hmm. working uh, dances, square dances, any place that we could. And uh, when I was right out of high school, I'd been, I graduated on, on uh, Friday. And on Sunday, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, you want a job? I said, I sure do. So I came to Nashville and went to work on the Grand Ole Opry. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started. I traveled with uh, the stars up here for about I guess about three years before I actually got into the publishing mm -hmm. end of it. How did you get with Tree? Uh, I would think Tree had been started. It didn't really have anything going. Some of the uh, didn't have an office or anything. Mm -hmm. it, some of the announcers at WSM had had written some songs, so they gave the songs to Tree because it was owned by Jack Stapp, who was program director of WSM. And they would get me to come out and sing, uh, do their demos. They paid me ten dollars a night to sing all night mm -hmm. long doing those demos. And Jack would come by the studio sometimes, and he would talk to me. I was a real shy young guy, and, and uh, very nervous uh, about anybody in authority, you know. Uh, but he apparently was impressed with me and called me one day and asked me if I would get with a singer-songwriter that was working at the old Andrew Jackson Hotel. So I, I said, gee, I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to do it. He said, you'll do fine. So I went down and got with her and took her out and put the songs down and called him and told him what had happened. And he said, he thanked me. And a couple hours later, he calls me and says, uh, asked me if I'd come to his office. And I did. And he asked me if I'd like to go to work for Tree. I said, well, I don't know anything about publishing. He said, I don't either, so we'll learn together. <laughs> so he gave me $35 a week to go to work for, for Tree. And I continued to make my living as a musician for many, many years as the company was growing. Isn't your story one of, okay, you started as an employee, but, but you did a good job. You impressed your, your boss, Jack Stapp, and, and you got more, uh, you got a percentage of the company, and then... Uh, a, few years, a few years after um, I started with the company, Jack left WK, uh, WSM to go to WKDA mm -hmm. as president of it. And um, Lou Cowan, who was a partner in Tree with Jack, had to get out because he became program director of, of CBS. Mm -hmm. And um, so to, because of conflict of interest, I suppose, he had to get out. So at that point, I became a minority owner of Tree. I, owned, I got 30% of it. And later on, I got another 10%. So I had 40% and then went through the years. And then when Jack died in 1980, uh, I think it was 80 or 81, I, I bought mm -hmm. all of his stock. So I became sole owner of the company. So you've, you've been with it, building it beginning. up. You, you knew what you were getting into. Well, every day. But I enjoyed it. It was a wonderful experience for me and I love the music business I think it's just a you know it's a great it's it's great fun and it's uh, and it's very pleasing to, to see the results of uh, of your efforts mm -hmm. uh, when you take a young writer who just come who comes in off the street and uh, he doesn't know where he's going and you take him and and you guide him you nudge him you you bend him you shape him and one day he turns out to be a Roger Miller, which is one of the people that I discovered. And I'm so proud of Roger because 
Roger and I, <laughs> Tree, <laughs> have a smash hit on Broadway mm -hmm. Huck in, Finn. in Huck Finn. Mm -hmm. Roger wrote all those great songs. I went up to the opening and it was fantastic. Those songs are some of the best ones he's ever written. Let me it's going to be a big, big hit. Let me get back and ask, what does a publisher do? What, what's function a function of a publisher? Mm -hmm. A good publisher tries to find uh, a young writer who hasn't been discovered mm -hmm. or just a great song. He finds a song and takes it, gets it recorded, and, and hopefully turns it into a, a standard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's your job as a publisher to develop, to find the raw material and develop it and take it to the right singer. Where do you find these songwriters and songs? You just open you know, the doors? Let, let, me, let me tell you a little story, Don. For 30 years, I suppose, Tree had an open door policy. Anybody could walk in off the streets mm -hmm. and we'd listen to their songs. My staff came to me one day and said, we want to talk to you. And I said, well, talk. They said, we have done some research and found that in 30 years of listening to the material that comes in off the street, not one song has ever been recorded. In 30 years. Because it seems that the hits or the writers who are capable of writing good songs are referrals. Mm -hmm. They'll be referred to me by another writer or brought to me by another writer or somebody who is a professional or somebody, it might be somebody I just run into somewhere. Mm -hmm. But that walking in and off the streets is such a, a roll of the dice. It's such a long shot that uh, I, I, it was hard for me to believe that not one person was found walking in off the street. Mm -hmm. You have worked with a lot of very successful writers. You've worked yes. with writers that didn't make it. Yes. What, uh, are there characteristics and attributes of, of, of the successful songwriter that the non-successful one doesn't have? And what, and what are they? Um, a successful songwriter has an ability to communicate in his mm -hmm. songs. He's saying that little special thing that the one, the, the unsuccessful writer doesn't have. It's a little spark. It's a little uniqueness. It might come from the idea, mm -hmm. or from the title, or from a musical hook or something. But he's got that little special quality that the average writer doesn't have. I don't look for songwriters. I look for song craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And almost everybody's a songwriter. The housewife who gets up in the morning washing the dishes or taking care of the babies or something, mad at her husband because he didn't treat her right, can write a song. Mm -hmm. But it might not be any good. But the song craftsman sits down and he knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going almost from the beginning. And he'll put that little special touch of magic in the song that the average person does not know how to do. Many times it'll take him a lot of years to happen. He'll pay his dues. Mm -hmm. We always say we we're 15 year overnight successes. Mm -hmm. But you've got to pay your dues to really know what it's all about. But you were sort of born, I guess, with that little touch. And all you have to do is be able to discover it in you and use it. You told me at one time, uh, interview 200 years ago maybe, that it took three to five years for a songwriter to develop once they got to, to town or once you had After we find them. them, yes. Yeah. Why After does it take that long? Well, uh, they come in from Iplin Switch somewhere, and they've got the ability to write, but they haven't been on the scene. They really haven't had that uh, competitive world beating their brains out. Mm -hmm. They haven't been put on the spot. They haven't had to sit there competing with the, that great writer who has already arrived. And it takes a while for them to get in tune with with those little special touches that a song has to have. So once he starts getting on the trail of something, it still takes a while for you to get the songs demoed, start getting them recorded, and for him to write enough good songs to become a very successful writer. So it takes two, three, five years. Roger Miller, when I found him, I almost immediately started getting a song cut here and there for him, but there was no great explosion, 
until 1964 when he absolutely just, you know, mm -hmm. became unbelievably hot pop country and everything else. But that was through his own recordings, though. Well, not necessarily. Well, yeah, had, but his he had songs. Andy Williams and, and all his that songs stuff. were had been recorded by many people: mm -hmm. Jim Reeves, Ernest Tubb, Andy Williams, you name it. But then he, because he was such a great talent, those great songs and the combination of the songs and him together, he just exploded. Mm -hmm. You said the key to a publish, for publishers getting these songs recorded. How do you get a song recorded by a top act? Well, we we uh, act? we take the song, make a demo on it. A demonstration tape or record, and take it to the singers, uh, to the producers, people that we know we have contacts with. You, through the years, you develop all your contacts, and and also, if you're good at what you do, you have the ability to determine what song is good for what artist. We call it casting, and you can. You sort of know, and you're going to miss a lot. But if you try hard enough, and if you pitch enough, if you're enough places, enough times with enough songs, you're going to get a lot of songs recorded. I don't think anybody gets more songs recorded than Tree does. And I know they don't have as many hits as we do, because we'll always have two to three times as many hits as any other publisher. Is that because you've got two to three much time uh, effort uh, going we out there? Well, we just... Uh, we're a volume company. We, it's, it's our, you know, the policies we have are, I've always thought that you need a lot of songwriters, and I uh, have always gone out and looked for the best songwriters I could find and get as many as possible, and then I push my staff all the time to keep getting terrific volume. We've been the number one publisher for 12 years in a row, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll do it again this year, but it's strictly volume that makes the difference. How many times do does a, an average song, and I know there's no such thing as an average song, but how many times do you have to pitch, pitch this average song before it's going to get cut? An average song rarely will get cut. Mm -hmm. No, I'm talking about, song. you know, the, you know, the, uh, the hit song. It depends. Sometimes uh, it'll get turned down for years. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember in the 60s, Curly Putman wrote Green Green Grass at Home, and he was working for me, and, and uh, he called me back in the room back there, and he sung the song, and I said, gee, that's really good. And it uh, laid around the office, not laid around, it was being pitched, but it took about nine months for it to get cut the first time. And then uh, Johnny Darrell did it, and it wasn't much of a hit. Porter Wagoner picked it up and went to about number eight, I think, in the top ten with it. Jerry Lee Lewis cut it in an album. It was released in uh, England, and Tom Jones heard it and cut it, and it was a worldwide number one smash. So you see what a chain mm -hmm. of events it took to make that song the great standard that it is today. Now it's been recorded, I don't know, five hundred to a thousand times. I don't even know how many. Does it take most songs a, a, a lot of pitching, a lot of a lot of no. time to, to get out like that? Not really. Most uh, we we tend to know mm -hmm. pretty well whether a song has it or not. And in most cases, I say in most cases, uh, the great songs will be recorded like that. Mm -hmm. But then there's that song that you're not quite sure of, and it takes the, the right artist to breathe the magic into it that it takes for it to become a big hit. Uh, and those songs will surprise you. You might have to pitch them a lot of times. But somebody will pick it up. Mm -hmm. If I like a song, I never stop pitching it. I've had songs recorded five years after I started pitching it. But I liked it and kept mm -hmm. pitching it. Uh, everybody at Tree pitched uh, a song um, that Michael um, Martin did. I mean, Mar uh, Michael, uh, um, well, lost his name. <laughs> <laughs> He'll hate me for this. Uh, uh, what's Michael Forever Murphy. For? Murphy. Murphy. Yeah, Michael, Michael Martin Murphy. Murphy. Yeah. I, my mind yeah. went, uh, what's Forever For? That song was cut a number of times and pitched mm -hmm. over and over and over till finally Michael Murphy got the, the right performance and it was a big hit for him. Uh, Do you still But there are many, uh, yeah, when, if I hear something I really like, mm -hmm. I'll grab it and run out and try to get a special record on it. Basically, of course, 
I use a lot of songs because I'm a producer. I produce a number of acts and and uh, continue to to get many songs recorded like that. Mm -hmm. Are there stages of development a writer goes through? Yeah. That you've seen. What what yeah. are they? It's they it's a they go through that early great enthusiasm for wanting to make it, and then they go through that that little period of adjusting to not making it, but he doesn't even realizing, realize that he has, he's developing that computerization that's going on inside of his mind that uh, he's learning and he becomes so discouraged. And yet I can see him, him uh, becoming better. He's, he's refining uh, every day and he doesn't really know it until one day somebody says, wow, what a great song, let me have that, I'll cut it. Mm -hmm. And then he starts beginning to see. I think the more uh, good songs you write and the better, the more success you have, the more you start understanding where you're going, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, so it's, it's stages of learning. There's an emphasis on co-writing in Nashville, and I know a tree. Uh, why? Do you, is, is that part of the learning process? I would prefer that they didn't. Mm -hmm. But it's just a thing that's happened. I guess two heads are better than one. Um, sometimes I think there's too much co-writing, mm -hmm. and yet I'll take a hit. I don't care how it comes to me. If it's uh, written by one person or 20 people, it doesn't really matter. But there's an awful lot of that going on now, uh, co-writing between uh, pub songs that write for this publisher and that mm -hmm. publisher. It causes an awful lot of split publishing, which I'm not real happy about. Mm -hmm. But I certainly don't want to stop the, the creative processes. Mm -hmm. well, I could because I have the right to stop my writers from writing with anybody else. But I don't want to do that. Uh, and there's uh, an excitement, uh, a chemistry that's created between the writers. Mm -hmm. So you certainly don't want to do anything to, to hamper that. After a song's recorded, then what? Now, now what are you going to do? Well, now you're going to try to get it recorded over and over and over because that's where standards come from. You're going to get it played on the radio. You're going to get it used as commercials. You're going to get it used in movies. You're going to get it used in every way that you can to make it become a standard. And the only way a song can become a standard is to be used over and over and over. Okay, you're a producer. Why would you want to cut a song that somebody else had recorded? Because I think that I have a way of doing it a little differently so I could have a hit with it. Mm -hmm. And I might want it for my album. Mm -hmm. uh, my, you certainly uh, want to put out an album that's full of good songs and, and uh, an entertaining album. And it might be a song that an artist really likes. One of your artists might like it. So you say, okay, we'll try it. And then surprisingly, it comes off so different and so good that you release it as a single. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. How does a publisher make money? Many ways. You make it from the record sales. You make it from print. You make it from movies, commercials, performances, and uh, uh, radio, television, special uh, video. Any, it, it's just amazing how many ways you can use music. Mm -hmm. And we make money in every, every time it's used in any different way. OK, when, a, when an album is sold, how much money do you get per song? It's going to very soon be five cents per song. On an album? Per song on each album, right. Okay, how about a single? Uh, same amount. Okay. Now, that's for mechanicals. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we split that with the writer. Mm -hmm. You get 50-50. Right. Uh, now, how about performances? Uh, can you break down per performance of what it would be? No, BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC have their own mm -hmm. ways of doing that. And the writer's paid and we're paid. We're paid separately. What, what major expenses do you have uh, as a publisher? The, the most expensive part of publishing is your staff. I have a very, very expensive staff. Another very expensive uh, part of it is your demonstration records, mm -hmm. tapes. Very expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year we, we spend on that. I also have three recording studios here in Nashville that I support, and we're doing uh, the, uh, our demos in. So, uh, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Now, the writer... And pitching the songs. I mean, there's, there's huge expenses in so many different ways. Mm -hmm.
but the writer gets to keep his 50% with little or no overhead. Right. Pencil and paper, that's, right. that's about it. We pay for the overhead. Yeah. What about the uh, sheet music? Is there much of a demand for sheet music in country music? In, in some instances. Folios are becoming very popular. Mm -hmm. How do you collect this money? Well, we, we, uh, we have arrangements with printing companies that do all that. Mm -hmm. We don't actually print our own music. We make a deal with Hal Leonard Music Company. They print, mm -hmm. and then they pay us so much per uh, piece of sheet music or so much per use of our song in folios. Okay, mechanicals, do you use Harry Fox or do you use Harry Fox. from the labels? Harry Fox collects. Mm -hmm. And that's an agency in New York, collects, yes. collects all the mechanicals that you have, yes. all the companies, and just sends you a check. Right. And then on, on performances? BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC pay us directly. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you uh, and your bookkeeping department to divide all of that between you and the songwriter. Is yes, that, the, the mechanicals, the print. Well, performance rights, they go straight to they the go songwriter, direct. yeah. The mechanicals, the print, and any other use of the song, uh, we, we handle the accounting. How big a staff does Tree have? Uh, 35 or 40 people. <laughs> You've lost track? Yeah, I don't know how many. <laughs> <laughs> Come and go. <laughs> yeah. How about how many songwriters do you have over there? Uh, probably 70, 75. Uh -huh. How many songs do you need to get recorded each year to keep the doors open? Do you know? No, uh, the number, the, uh, I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. We get huge numbers of songs recorded. It depends on how well the songs do. Mm -hmm. It's the income that counts. And of course, the, the more volume you get, the do, but do better you have opportunity. A goal? Do, do you establish goals, I want a song cut a day or something like that? No, my, I, establish, I establish the goal of I want everybody's next record. <laughs> and if I get that, then I'll be very happy. My staff laughs at me. They say, you're kidding, aren't you? I said, no, I'm very serious. Yeah. I know we can't get them, but we're going to go for them. Every day, I want to try to get the next, everybody's next record. Mm -hmm. And if you're really going for it, you can't miss. How long from the time you've gotten their record, that record comes out, till the time the money comes in? Isn't that a pretty good amount months, of time? Months, months. Because you don't know when it's going to be released sometimes. Mm -hmm. The release schedule has a lot to do with it. And then it has to get out there. It has to be uh, sold, collected, and, and then paid to us. So it, months. Aren't you generally running about a year behind time, though? Sometimes. Uh, uh, anywhere from three months to a year. And how about internationally? How do you get songs That's longer. We have our companies over yeah. there, too, that handle our songs. We send all of our songs over, and they get them recorded in foreign countries. Mm -hmm. And we, they also get the American record released over there. So. And then we collect over there the same way we do here. And our publishing, our, our uh, representatives over there do it for us. And, um, and then they send the money here. It takes longer mm -hmm. because they have to go through that whole process, collect the money, and send it to us. So you almost double the time. Do you have your own offices or do you work with another established company over there? We have, in Germany, we still have tree. Uh, we call it Frankfurt Tree, mm -hmm. our own company. But you, we did it in conjunction with another company. The rest of the world, we are now with EMI, who handles our catalog for every country of the world. Okay. How does someone get into publishing? It's really not that hard. Uh, you you got to be a little bit lucky to come up to a publishing firm at the right time. Mm -hmm. I've never thought that publishing was, was so confusing or hard to learn. It's just like everything else, you've got to be determined to go out there and, and fight the battles every day. It, you, I think knowing a song is your greatest prerequisite. Mm -hmm. You must know a song. And you've got to have the ability to take that song and pitch it to the right person or you don't, you're lost. Uh, but there's nothing really hard about publishing other than that. Mm -hmm. You can learn copywriting. You can learn... Uh, how to do demos, you can learn all those things. But you need some talent mm -hmm. where music is concerned. Know music and know how to spot it when, it's, when it comes to you. If you don't do that, then you're in the wrong place. But how would you get to the position of a tree or Warner Brothers or uh, some of the other companies, Combine, wanting to, wanting to hire somebody? We've, 
we've uh, hired a lot of the kids out of college. They come in uh, during the summer and work, or during or during the year sometime, and uh, they try to get credits for it. Uh, and we're so impressed with them mm -hmm. that we hire them. We have a number of people who work for us right now that that came through uh, to us through the colleges. Mm -hmm. Uh, the real professionals normally start off as musicians. I'm talking about in a professional department. Mm -hmm. They no normally start off as musicians that didn't make it, uh, or as singers or whatever. And they have enough talent that they have an understanding of the music industry. Mm -hmm. So they get started that way. But they just couldn't make it as a talent, you know, a star. Mm -hmm. How much, how much does uh, someone entry level make in publishing? Starting? Mm -hmm. in, what, uh, in what level? I mean, are you talking about secretarial? Uh, pitching, no, pitching songs. Pitching. Um, we, we've started them at um, 300, maybe 300, 350 a week. Um, some of the kids that, that have started in the past started lower than that, I guess, because we take them out of the library mm -hmm. and say, okay, we're going to take you and give you a shot at being a song plugger. So if he was just a librarian who was making tape copies, we, we, we were impressed with him. He becomes a song plugger. We might start him off at $250, $300 a week. And then he continues to grow, or maybe we bring somebody else in at $500 a week. And, and as they get on up there, they're making $65,000, $70,000 a year. And Would if that you be get a into manager? yeah, and then yeah. if you get on into uh, say a vice president of the company, he can make anywhere from 150 to a quarter of a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Nashville's known as a publisher's town. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And, and Fogel Song just said that uh, publishers make more money than than record companies. Well, that's uh, I don't think that that publishers make more money mm -hmm. than record companies. Because you've got to realize that we only make uh, two and a half cents per record, and the record label is making dollars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, there's a great mm -hmm. difference in how much we all make. Um, but you make it more different in, kinds of in, ways. in different ways. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I think that. I lost your question. Well, why, is, why is Nashville a publisher's town? Oh, because if you, if you go back to the beginning, the Grand Ole Opry was sort of the mother church of, you know, the music industry here. It started um, where the musicians and singers made their living doing the Grand Ole Opry on Saturday night and then going out and uh, playing all around the country. And a little studio was started by Owen Bradley. And he started bringing some of the, the singers in. And he had to have songs. So uh, if you got wherever the singers are, the songwriters are going to start coming in. And now there's a proliferation of, of recording studios. And the more recording studios, the more artists there are. And the more artists there are, the more songwriters there are. So everybody starts converging on Nashville. Is it this where most of the creative people are coming out of? The, yeah. The artists yeah, themselves country, are coming out of, yeah. Especially country music. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that convergence of all the forces caused Nashville to just become a publisher's town. Then uh, a few years ago, the singers, the songwriters, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker all became publishers because they realized there was a lot of money in it. Mm -hmm. And you got more hip pocket operations around than you can dream of, thousands of them, but there are very few really bona fide big companies, Tree being one of the largest. Is there anything else you'd rather do with your life? Oh, no, no. I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm involved in a lot of other things. I, as investments, mm -hmm. I'm developing a chain of restaurants, uh, Poe Folks Restaurants with Burt Reynolds. Mm -hmm. He's my partner. Uh, I own the Stockyard uh, re Restaurant and, and uh, Lounge and uh, which is a, it's sort of a fun thing for me to do. I own a number of recording studios. Um, and I'm involved in a lot of different things, but music is my life, and I would never allow anything to get in the way of that. 
because it's fun. And I wonder, I've wondered sometimes why I was so lucky to get involved in something that I love so much. You must, you must have wanted it. Off well, uh, I didn't know you couldn't do it. Yeah. I really, I never knew you couldn't do it. I, everybody kept telling me I couldn't, and I kept thinking I could. So uh, maybe I was blessed with a little determination. Whatever. It's been wonderful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything I've ever done. Well, buddy, thanks for coming here today and, and talking to us. My pleasure. It's good to see you, Don. Okay. Yeah. This is Don Cusick with the Music Biz.